Okay. Um, I wanted to say that there's a lot of, um, when uh, going over Daniel, there's uh, what these uh, lessons do, what the author did was um, he'll veer off of the book of Daniel and talk about topics using other scriptures because of references in Daniel. So this morning was an example. Um, Daniel talks about the people of God being delivered. Jan Daniel 12, verse 1. And uh, how does that look? How does God deliver his people? When and how? And so he goes into the second coming and the rapture and that type of thing and explains that. So a lot of these lessons, um, some of them talk about the mark of the beast. Um, others talk about uh, what happens to a person when he or she dies. When Daniel says, and those in the dust will be resurrected, Daniel chapter 12 again. And so those lessons I had to, by necessity, just skip over. Not that they're not important, but skip over. Because we're, this is the 20th and last session today. Uh, there's a total of 32 in these. So I, I just had to skip over some. You can. You can get the others. Uh, I think there's one of them that we ran out completely. But um, if you want the others, you'll have to look on your numbers. You know which number this is by looking at the very back. There's a tiny number that says PS, which means Prophecy Seminar. PS 27. And so I'm using this one, even though there's a few of them after this one, as a close to this whole seminar on um, living for God, like um, the first six chapters of Daniel describe. These, these men were uh, just uh, heroes of, of faith. But not that you and I cannot be a hero in that same caliber. We can also have a strong faith like they did. So uh, we're going over this. So let's have a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this past month and the things that we have um, gone over in Daniel, not in minute detail, but enough to inspire us to trust in you, your control of this world. We know this, God. And also as an expression of our trust in you to live our lives in an in a upright way, as we see in the first half of Daniel so we thank you for this book that can lead us to personal revival and reformation. Bless us, Lord, as we look at these verses of your word to describe the way of life we should be living today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Can we turn up uh, uh, the, the mic, please? <coughs> testing one, two, testing one, two, three. That's better. Okay, I don't have slides uh, for uh, tonight for this lesson. Um, so we're on this one, Time for Holy Living. <clears throat> and on the top of the page, on page two, it says, The book of Daniel has revealed to us some fantastic events. We discovered the tremendous truth about judgment going on since 1844, etc. So we're going to look at, in generalities, the general themes here, the judgment hour, uh, is what we're going to look at first. So question number one says, when did the judgment in heaven begin? Now this is in reference to the judgment that, that, that takes place before Christ comes back. So there's a couple of things I want to say about that that I didn't mention before. Um, some scholars have pointed out interesting judgment language in the Bible. So I'll give you the very first, literally the very first example, that's in Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3. When God um, is looking for Adam and Eve, and he says, Adam, Adam, where are you? Okay, when they, when they fell, where are you? And then, and then, and then, um, Adam responds, how does he respond to God? I hid myself and I was embarrassed because I was naked. 
Uh, and then God, God, God engages in a conversation. Well, who told you you were nude? And then Adam says, well, the woman that you gave me. <laughs> it's almost as if he's pinning the blame on God. You shouldn't have given me this woman. And um, so in chapter 3, there is judgment going on there. God judges Adam. God judges Eve. God judges um, Satan. But the interesting thing is, before there's that judgment, God goes looking for Adam. Now, do you think that God was ignorant of what Adam and Eve just did? Of course not. He goes looking for them. So some scholars will say that, in a sense, is a judgment in and of itself because he's looking for them. Another one is Noah. Very early on. Did God judge the world on the day that the waters burst forth from the surface of the deep and from the sky? Did God judge them for the first time on that day? No. Was that day a judgment? No, yes. yes, it was. Yes, it, was. It, it was a judgment on that day. It was, like a it was a close of probation. Yeah. But what had happened before that judgment day, that final judgment where people lost their lives literally, and some saved their lives. There was a judgment called by God because he tells Noah specifically, he says, the thoughts of men are continually wicked. Continually. But you have found favor in my eyes, he tells Noah. And so he tells him to build a big boat. So before God closes uh, earth's or you know that part of history didn't destroy the didn't close history in itself but before he you know did that the flood <clears throat> he had to have judged people already before that that they were continually wicked and he judged Noah already before the flood so it's not like the day of the flood caused people to change and therefore be judged by God righteous or not. That had happened before. So they could not have turned their thoughts around when the animals were going in. It had to be before the animals were going in. Yeah, it was, it was too late by that time. It was the day, it was the day of the final judgment, so to speak, on that day. Now here's the interesting thing. This is, this is interesting. On the day the animals went in, yeah. everybody, including the animals, were still in the ark for a week. Yes. <laughs> Is it, what were you going to say? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Okay. They really cut off till the <clears throat> Yeah. So, but once the animals came in, here's the interesting thing. Once the animals came in, you got to read the great controversy and what, how Alan White describes this. Once the animals came in, they had no way to shut the door as strong as they were, as the antediluvians were. They, they didn't shut the door. An angel shut the door. This was seven days before the flood hit. And so when the angel came and shut that big door, this invisible hand, it's interesting how people must have witnessed. They witnessed the animals coming in pairs and in sevens. How is that not convincing? But if it comes to that point and it's too late, nothing's going to convince them. It's interesting. Nothing will convince them. And so, you know, in Revelation, we read, let those who are filthy be filthy still. Let those who are clean be clean still. Now, is that verse in reference to the end of days when Christ comes back or before? before. It's before. God is making a judgment call. Those who are filthy, they're not going to change. It's just too late. We tried our best. They're not going to change. They're going to remain so. And those who are righteous, those who are saved... There's no turning back for them. Even though there's a time of trouble, they're going to stick with us. Um, he, he's not going to say that on the day Christ comes back. So, and there's other examples that this weak brain can't think of, but uh, there's examples of where God makes... Oh, here's another one. Here's another one. <laughs> Matthew chapter 25. Or is it Matthew 7? The sheep and the goats. The sheep and the goats. When Christ comes back, 
in the reference to the sheep and the goats, when Christ comes back, he's going to tell his angels to do something. Separate the sheep and the goats. Is on the day that Christ comes back, is he judging, okay, angels, these are the, that one's saved, that one's saved, that one. Or has that process and decision been made ahead of time? It's, it's ahead of time. Christ has already figured out who, who are the saved and who are the lost. So is that saying that the only communication that we have with God kind of rigid in whatever we've established ahead of time, right? I mean, that's what happens at the end. The Holy, the, you know, the, the Holy Spirit is starting to withdraw from the, from the earth, and if we have this relationship yeah. with the Lord that we have depended on Him, it's a habit we're depending on Him. Yeah. And, I mean, so we're secure in that, but if you haven't already secured that... Yeah, our relationship with Jesus, the connecting point uh, is through the Holy Spirit. Paul says in Romans 9, verse 4, I think it is, he says, those who have the Spirit of Christ belong to Christ. Those who do not, do not belong to Christ. So our connection with Christ, because Christ is not here physically, um, he can't be. Christ is limited in his human body, glorified as it is. And so the Holy Spirit brings Jesus to us, in you know ways that are hard to explain, but that's that's what he does. So Jesus is in my heart just as much as he is in your heart, and vice versa through the Holy Spirit. And that relationship you're talking about is our ticket to heaven. It's not the the rules and the commandments, important and valid as they are. It's the relationship that that counts. Um, anyways, so. Uh, Number two says, what Old Testament feast day symbolized the cleansing of the sanctuary? The answer is in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month. For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you. This is Leviticus 16, verses 29 and 30. This is the chapter of the Yom Kippur, uh, the day of atonement. And on that day... Excuse me, the people were cleansed and the sanctuary itself was cleansed. Was, was, the sanctuary itself was, excuse me, uh, for those of you on YouTube, we just had lunch. <laughs> the sanctuary itself was atoned for because of this transference element in, from person to sacrificed animal to the blood being spilt to the blood being sprinkled on the objects in the sanctuary. And then once a year, it had to be all cleaned up. Anyways, that's the point. Uh, the cleansing of the sanctuary took place on the Day of Atonement in the Old Testament. It was the 10th day of the seventh month. That was a feast day, and that was also known as a, a Sabbath because they had to rest. No matter what day it was fell on, it was, it, was a, it was a ceremonial Sabbath. By the way, in the 1800s, in 1844, um, those early Millerite believers who believed that Jesus would come back on October 22, 1844, that movement was known as the Seventh Month Movement. Because the Day of Atonement is on the 10th day of the seventh month. And, and it was known as the Seventh Month Movement. Yeah, it's interesting. Number three says, when the cleansing of the sanctuary was taking place in Israel, what were the people to do? Do you know the answer? You shall afflict your souls and do no work at all. What does it mean to afflict your soul? Does it mean like Martin Luther did? <laughs> flogging yourself? What does that mean to afflict your soul? How many of you have ever uh, bemoaned your own sinfulness? Can you raise your hand? I bemoan my own sinfulness. I do. Um, sometimes I loathe myself because of my sinfulness and my inconsistency. And then I have to remind myself, Jesus reminds me, don't focus too much on your fallenness. Focus on me. Remember, I'm merciful and just focus on me. <laughs> so it's sort of a, you just have to remind yourselves not to focus too much inward because then you'll get discouraged. Um, so, you know, in a, it's sort of a paradox. To afflict your souls means to really hate that part of you that I just, I hate being a sinner. <laughs> I hate being a sinner. And God, please forgive me my sins. 
I repent of my sins, Lord. And please, Lord, let me think. Have I done anything wrong? Or, um, you know, it includes that part, afflicting your souls. It's not... So this was on the Day of Atonement. So I understand not to be morbidly focused on your negative part of yourself. We are also to have gratitude to Jesus for the victories. Amen? We are also to be grateful and joyful in Him. But this day was not necessarily a day of joyfulness. It was a day of cleansing. Right? So... If you come home after a three-month vacation and nobody house sat for you, uh, <laughs> your house stinks. <laughs> and if you left some food accidentally on the countertop, <laughs> oh my goodness, when you come back, oh, you may feel, oh, home, I can use my own bathroom and sleep in my own bed. <laughs> That's what I do when I'm gone on someplace. Oh, I got my own bathroom and my own bed. But... Um, you know, if something is left for a long time and it's dirty, you usually don't rejoice. You go, oh man, I got to clean this place up, right? So the idea is not some morbid self-affliction and be negative and not focus on the positive and accentuate, accentuate the positive, eliminate the negative. That's not what this is about. It's about self-examining yourself and you know making sure you're right with god and asking for his mercy and, and grace and that that's what this day was like um, as the priest performed the cleansing of the sanctuary so god's people must have sinned cleansed must have must have sin cleansed from their lives this can only be accomplished by the power of christ since we today are living in the time that fulfills the day of atonement the anti-type the time of the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary we should be afflicting our souls and seeking God as never before. Um, you know, just, I guess I could put it this way. Be more serious about your relationship with God. Uh, just get really serious about it. And continue to growing and maturing in Jesus. Like Ephesians 4 says, the reason why there's apostles and evangelists and pastors, etc., is to help the people train them for the work of the ministry. And the ultimate goal is that we all grow and mature into the full stature of Christ. That's the idea, right? And that's a continual process. Okay, now, let's go to this other section. The call to holy living. 1 John 3, 1 says that we are called the sons of God. Amen? Yes. Sons of God and daughters of God, of course. So the Bible says. And um, in 1 John 3, 1... Let me ask you, are Christians like the world? Yes or no? Like what? Are Christians like the world? Yes or no? They are. Both answers are right. <laughs> Both answers are right. Yes and no. <laughs> um, because there are Christians that are like the world. And then you would probably have to, uh, you know, evaluate, well, is that what a Christian is, you know? Um, but there are Christians that you wonder, you, wouldn't, you couldn't differentiate. And yet they call themselves a Christian. So let's not be too hard on other people. Let's look at ourselves and if we're that way. Okay? Let's not focus so much on the speck of dust that is in other people's eyes, but on the two by six that is in our own eyes, what Jesus said. Okay, so that could indicate us, not just quote unquote them. We could be like the world. Yeah, let's look at ourselves. I could be like the world. So, you know, and of course, a, a bona fide follower of Jesus uh, is not like the world. Um, you know, we may be of the world, we may be in the world, but we're not of it, that idea. And then 1 John 3, 2, even though Christians are now children of God, what will they be when Jesus comes? The Bible says we shall be like him. Turn to the book of John, 1 John. 1 John, and let's go to chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. And I want you to look at verse 3. 1 John chapter 3. Um, well, let's start with verse 2. 1 John 3, verses 2 and 3. 1 John 3, verses 2 and 3. The Bible says, Beloved, now we are children of God. When? When are we children of God? 
Say it louder. Now. now you are children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we, what? Shall be. In other words, pristine perfection, like a, a brand new car that smells delicious on the inside. You ever buy a brand new car and the way new, that new car smell? I love that new car smell. <laughs> or new carpet. You ever smell new carpet that's been laid down? Oh, I love it. Or a fresh white t-shirt that has just come out of the wash with Clorox. <laughs> I love that smell of a new t-shirt, or brand new men's t-shirts. I love them. But we don't, it hasn't been revealed to us, Bianca, what you will be, that perfection. You don't know yet. But we have that hope that we will and that trust. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Amen? When he is revealed at his second coming, we know that we'll be like him. Look at verse 3. Everyone who has this hope, hope in what? In Jesus, in the, His second coming. Everyone who has this hope in Him does what? Purifies Himself. Finish it. Just as He is pure. Or even as He is pure. Right? In fact, here's a bonus verse. Go to chapter 2 and verse 6. Chapter 2 and verse 6. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. So if we have this hope in his second coming, we purify ourselves. Here's another bonus verse, and I may be just going ahead of myself. 1 Peter chapter 3. Go to 1 Peter, just a couple of pages to your left. 1 Peter chapter 3. And let's look at verse, let's see, where am I? Is this First Peter? Yes. Okay, I'm lost. Let me see here. First Peter, where is it? Is it, no, I'm sorry, no wonder why. Second Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3, that's why I couldn't find it. Okay. Look at verse, okay, 14. Look at verse 14, 2 Peter 3, 14. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things. In other words, when Jesus will come back and, you know, the new heavens and the new earth, um, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless is what he says. And then, um, that's actually, that's a good verse, but the one I really wanted to read is verse 11. Therefore, in other words, the you know, earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in what? Holy, Holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. So since we believe in these things, he says, well, if you're believing those things that are supposed to happen in the future, then look in your present. And if you want to be involved in part of that future, you better focus on your present. Because it's a cause and effect. The way we live our present will affect where we spend our time in the future. Whether in eternal destruction or, or life. Eternal life with Christ. And this is what you've heard me share this. This is the purpose of prophecy. Because Peter here is giving this prophecy about things in the world will burn up, etc. And the purpose of prophecy is to purify us in the present. That's the ultimate purpose, not just for information. And to be able to have long conversations at a table like we are having. The purpose of prophecy is to purify us now to get ready for when these things happen, right? Wouldn't you agree? Okay, so let's go back to the lesson. Let's look at number eight in your lesson. When Jesus comes, will people's character be changed? On the day he comes, will people's characters be changed? No. 
And we were referring to this before. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. It's too late then. It's obviously it's too late. We'll know people by their character in heaven, yes. And those characters are developed now in preparation for heaven. So um, it's, it's too late at that point. Number nine says, what counsel does the Apostle John give to Christians who are preparing for the second coming? First John 2.15 says, love not the world, nor the things that are in the world. Now, Obviously, this is not talking about do not love nature <laughs> or do not love people. He's referring to the world and the things in the sense of that which is opposed to God's kingdom and what God's kingdom stands for. And so when I say opposed, I'm not saying go out there and hate the atheists and those who don't believe in the Bible. I'm not saying that. But just worldliness, the character of worldliness that is of it is earthy and temporal in thinking and what Paul really comes down hard on in first Corinthians the chapter the first three chapters not the worldly philosophy and wisdom because that's foolishness to God so he's saying don't love the world or things um, in, in other words it means to not love the realm of sin Christians should be more use, most useful and active. I'm reading my own notes here. Christians should be the most useful and active people as far as taking care of the natural world and loving people in tangible ways. Right? So it doesn't mean not to love natural or, or, or people. Uh, turn your page to page four. Um, Jesus' prayer was that while they were in the world, they not be of the world. Right? First John 2.16. I just read that a little bit ago. What are the things of the world that the Christian does not look upon? The lust of the flesh? No, I didn't read that. I read 1 John 2, 6, not 16. Um, let's read that. 1 John 2, 16. So there's, there's uh, some things there that John says to uh, avoid. 1 John 2, 16. So it says this, For all that is in the world... What's the first one? The lust of the flesh. What's the second one? The lust of the eyes. And what's the third one? And the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So you got the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Let's see what our notes say in the lesson here. Uh, well, you got the answers. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. The lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, I'm reading the note underneath question 10. Certainly describe activities that God's children ought to avoid today. In an age of sexual permissiveness and lax morals, Christians maintain the high moral standards of God's word, word while the world lauds and features sex appeal, pornographic literature, sex outside of marriage, live-in arrangements, etc. The Christian will resist these appeals. Okay. Let me say this. I have a comment on, on that comment. Um, lust does not exclusively refer to sex. I don't think that's what John's ultimate point here. Um, it can refer to lust after things. It can refer to lust after position. It can be referred to a lust for vanity. Uh, yeah, things. It can, it can refer to, to lust of things. So it doesn't necessarily, or sex, of course. So it doesn't necessarily, it's not restricted to sexual matters. Um, so the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. This is interesting. Um, the lust of the eyes, um, we can all comment different ways how, you know, what that means. But I kind of think of the lust of the eyes, it's, it's almost like referring to coveting yeah. because you, your eyes are what provides the stimulus for your brain and your brain interprets the images. Yeah. But we're not so mechanical that our brain just interprets there's double doors there, there's lights, there's a nice uh, Rolls Royce, there's a nice vacation spot. 
you know, $1,200 a night hotel. <laughs> There's these nice clothes, a first Versace, a Gucci bag, a purse, that's $2,000. <laughs> you know, it, you're not just interpreting. The way we're designed is that we can begin to have emotions and make decisions based on emotions. Mm -hmm. We interpret, we process. And so the lust of the eyes, coveting is you are processing information and your emotions follow and desires and urges follow that. And sooner or later, you can find yourself coveting because of what your eyes are seeing. I think that's one of the things that happened in Genesis 3 with, with Eve. She saw that the fruit was good for food. Anyways, um, and then the pride of life. Um, pride, spiritual pride is the most dangerous thing in my humble opinion. Number 11, what is going to happen to all of these things of the world? The world passes away and the lust thereof. Number 12, what standards of conduct should control the mind of the Christian who is preparing for the coming of his Lord? You know this, Philippians 4, 8. Okay. He should think of those things that are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, and of good report. Our thoughts are the battleground of good and evil. Our thoughts are the center of that battleground okay our thoughts are john says every man that has this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure we read that early in first john 33 so we have to um we have to maintain temperance and control of our thought patterns we we just we just have to what that does is it takes awareness of your thoughts um, it takes the Holy Spirit to help you be aware of your thought patterns. Um, and, and by the way, this is, this is the core of our being because uh, this is what God looks at. Because all of us here may be innocent as far as certain acts are concerned, but we can be guilty as far as the thoughts of those acts, same acts are concerned. Christ goes for the jugular, so to speak. He knows our thought patterns. He knows our thoughts. Don't be fooled. Um, and so by the grace of Christ and his Holy Spirit, we are to have our thoughts captivated to whom? To Christ. My thoughts are captive to the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul says. And the, I'm sorry? Let this, mind be in you. Let this mind be in you as was in Christ Jesus. Philippians 2. Jesus humbled himself. He didn't grasp a thing to be equal to God or something to grasp, but he humbled himself and be, took the form of a servant. So let this mind be in you. Be humble and of service to others and, you know, that type of thing. Number 13, what controls people who have accepted Jesus Christ. Look at, uh, in Romans, I, I actually put verse 4. I think it's actually verse 4. So what controls us? You know the answer? The Spirit. Yes, it's the Holy Spirit. I want to read that. Romans 8, verse 4. And that verse says this that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but, finish that, according to the Spirit. It is the Spirit. Who, now look at your note on, uh, beneath question number 13. The Bible indicates that people have two natures, the carnal and the spiritual. These two natures are warring against each other. To fill the carnal or fleshly desires is to put oneself against God. But to fill the mind with spiritual desires is to put oneself in harmony with God. A person who feeds the mind with all the trash of the world is feeding the carnal fleshly nature. If one continues to feed that nature, it will prevail in the life. That is a guarantee. That's why God is so concerned that Christians walk after the Spirit, filling their minds with that which will elevate and noble them and prepare them for the coming of the Lord. Another good chapter to read regarding this is Galatians chapter 5. It's a very, very good chapter. 
Do not keep in step with the Spirit, Paul says there in Galatians 5. Keep in step with the Spirit, etc. Um, and so we are in a battle. We have to, by the power of the Spirit, war against our tendencies to want to go back to the old way of life. And we all get that pool. All of us get that pool. I get that pool. You get that pool. To go back to the old ways of thinking and or behaving or talking, etc. We all get that pool. We're all in the same boat. I'm no better than you are in that sense just because I'm a pastor. We all get that pool to retrace our steps and go back to Egypt. We have to fight against that pool by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, Satan, get behind me. Lord, please help me. Please help me, Jesus. Help me to honor you. Um, once in a great while, <laughs> once in a great while, I'll think this, that when I have victory over myself, over thoughts, uh, when I have victory, uh, I don't think this all the time, but once in a while I'll say, I wonder what it looked like in the invisible realm where spirits exist. Like I can hear the demons screaming out of horrid frustration because they didn't cause me to fall. And the angels with a quiet, silent, strong joy. <laughs> Isn't that cool? It's cool to think about it that way. And of course, it puts a smile on, on Christ's face. Number 14. All right, let's, uh, let's go. We're going to kind of switch gears here and look at our dress, our physical dress, and what Paul says to uh, Timothy and Peter. How does Paul indicate people should, should dress who are preparing for the Advent? Now, let me preface it by saying this. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. And while you're doing that, I want to say this. Um, this does not mean <laughs> that you are more saved or you are being legalistic because you're paying attention to how you dress or talk or anything. That's, that's not what this means. Um, as you've heard me say, our covenant relationship with Jesus Christ it is a, we have a covenant with him. <clears throat> On Passover night, Jesus said, this is the new covenant in my blood. So through the shed blood of Jesus, we have this covenant with God. Relationship. Every relationship has terms to it. An agreement on both sides. We agree if we're going to enter a relationship, we have to come to agreements. Even big companies that merge, they have these big thick contracts of their mutual agreements, right? You have to have agreements. And you have to both sign on the dotted line to agree to the terms of a relationship. I've heard of how, I think this is a conversation I had with a young lady at ASU one time. It was an open relationship. Yeah, I, my memory is being uh, you know, refreshed. This relationship was open. We were having a Bible study. This was some years ago, maybe eight, nine years ago. And we were having an open Bible study at Starbucks at ASU campus. And so, the, you know, I was with some students and we were sitting and having a Bible study. And we were talking about relationships. And there was these two girls. We were sitting in a round table in the, in the Starbucks. And there was these two girls there sitting next to us. They were on their laptops. And we were just talking openly and sharing opinions and Bible verses. <laughs> and one of the girls turns around, she says, excuse me, she says, um, do you mind if I, I'm really, really fascinated by what you guys are talking about. Do you mind if I join you? I said, sure. <laughs> so she comes over and she's wearing these dark sunglasses. And we're talking about relationships. <laughs> and she just starts bawling her eyes out. She's just crying. And she's, oh man, this is just exactly what I need. And she turns and she tells her girlfriend who was telling her, you gotta come over here. She says, come over here. And she hits her on the shoulder. So the girl comes up and she joins us. And we're having an amazing Bible study and talk about relationships and boyfriend-girlfriend relationships. These are young, young ladies on the campus. 
And man, this girl was crying. The other girl started crying. And the first one started talking about her open relationship with her boyfriend. And how her boyfriend was now attracted to this other girl. And here I'm thinking to myself, and I might have asked her, I don't remember, but I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute. This is an open relationship. What do you care if he's an interested in? You know what an open relationship means, right? You can date and go to bed with anybody you want. That's an open relationship. So we agree to go out together and date, etc. But it's open. It's open. So if, you, know, you can do what you want with other guys. I can do that with other women. That's an open relationship. That's what it means. So she was hurt and this guy and he's looking at this other girl and I'm thinking, weren't the terms to your relationship open? Hello? Then why are you all upset? <laughs> you agreed to this. So even open relationships, uh, I don't believe they work because eventually if you really, really like a person to start falling in love with a person, do you really want to share that person with somebody else? I mean, that's, I, I think that's twisted, morbid thinking. Um, but anyways, why did I go into all of that? I have no idea. <laughs> Spark the memory. Uh, we were talking about dress. Where was I going with this? I have no idea. Uh, what was I saying? Anyways, well, what I said was pretty good, don't you? <laughs> I have no idea what I said that. About dress. I know that's how I started. I don't know how this fits into dress, so <laughs> maybe it'll come to me later. First Timothy chapter 2. Um, First Timothy 2. Let's look at that verse. Okay, 1 Timothy 2 is at verses 9 and 10. This is what it says. Oh, I started talking about terms to relation. This is where I was going. So, your, the way you dress, the way you eat, your, your good behaviors, that's not what gets you into heaven. Okay? In other words, that's not your ticket to go into heaven. However, it is the fallout of what you do on your way to heaven. Right? That's the terms of the relationship. If we want to follow Christ with all of our hearts, because He has graced us with His salvation for free, not based on our own good works, but by His grace, His kindness towards us, then based on that, the term to my relation with Jesus is, Jesus, you gave your life for me. You have amazing things prepared for me in heaven. You give me eternal life. You exemplify what kind of life I should live. You died for my sins. Oh my goodness, I should live my life for you. I agree to these terms. I agree that I want to live my life for you, Jesus. Not in order to get into heaven through my good works, but the good works are a fruit. Wouldn't you agree? They're a good fruit. That includes what we do with our lives and how we dress. That's where I was going with this. <laughs> so there's terms that we agree on. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 9 and 10 says this. In like manner also, that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. Okay, so this is not saying that if you see a woman or if you see a little girl with her hair braided, <gasps> ooh, okay. Um, apparently, in, um, in Timothy was, where was Timothy? Was he on Crete or Ephesus? I don't remember exactly where uh, Timothy was left in charge of the church. This was a young pastor. And these are called the pastoral letters because the Apostle Paul, and experienced as he was, he's writing these letters to Timothy, how to be a good pastor. That's why they call them the pastoral letters. And uh, I can't remember if he was uh, left in Ephesus or Crete. Um, but um, women should adorn themselves in modest apparel, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. Um, some have said, you know, no jewelry at all. Um, 
because of what this verse says. And others have said, well, it's not, it's, the point is not the jewelry in itself is evil. It's the vanity behind it. Um, you know, I kind of see both points. I see both points. Because if you stay, that's what I'm talking about the women. The, the principle here is modesty. So that applies to men as well. But let's talk about the jewelry. If you do not wear jewelry because of what this says, the fact that you're not wearing jewelry, the danger could be, well, then you're more of a Christian than a person who does wear jewelry. Because a person who wears jewelry can be more involved in church and more cooperative and more kind and courteous than you who do not wear jewelry. Or it could be vice versa. You know, that's just the way it is. And so we have to be careful not to take this in such a dogmatic form that if I don't wear jewelry, I'm a better person than those who do. But, you know, but the flip side is, I can see the point of the other side, but Paul here is saying, you know, if you wear jewelry, it's usually because there may be a little bit of vanity behind it. Now, there's nothing wrong with a woman wanting to look pretty, right, ladies? Don't you want to look attractive? I don't know of any woman that says, I want to look ugly. I want to be low on myself and feel and look ugly. There's no woman that says that. I don't think there is. Um, regardless of your physical appearance, I don't, I'm not talking about your physical appearance. I'm just saying usually women don't think that way. And so I don't think there's anything wrong with a woman wanting to look, or men for that matter, but mostly women, wanting to feel pretty. Don't you want to feel pretty and and good about yourself and looking? Of course. I don't think there's anything wrong with that as a woman. So what do you think about the braided hair? That one gets okay, so I wish I would have brought my other Bible. In fact, I may have, but I have an amazing Bible that I bought a couple of years ago, and it's called the Cultural Background Study Bible by a couple of really, really solid scholars. And, it, and what this Bible is, that it's this thick. And what's it ded what it is dedicated to is not necessarily theological, also it'll include theological things, but the comments are directed as to help you understand the local cultures of why these things were written, the cultural background of the Bible. It's amazing. You learn so many cool things. And, um, and so I believe what this passage, Paul's point is that the principle of modesty is very important. Modesty. Now only you, men and women, can know and this is where the self-evaluation comes. Am I doing this because of vanity? You know, am I doing this because of vanity? You know, then stop doing it. And the reason being is there are some Adventists that wear jewelry and some that don't. Now, some may go overboard. You know, five necklaces here. Two watches. Five rings. <laughs> You know, I, you know, I would think that is a strong indicator of vanity. Um, the, there's a principle of modesty here and being careful of the image that we project to the world. And here's another thing. We are not like the world. We're not like the world. Let me give you another illustration of this. I don't wear a wedding ring. If you notice, I don't wear a wedding ring. My wife doesn't wear a, red, oh, a wedding ring. Um... <laughs> My wife, I don't think she'd mind me saying this, just the other day, she's, uh, she's training a new chaplain that was hired for the hospice company that she works for. Um, and, uh, and so she, she was telling me this. The other day we went shopping together, my wife and I, and she was talking about, how did your day go? And she was telling me all about her day. So he was asking me, how come you don't wear a wedding ring? She says, do I need a wedding ring? And he says, well, yeah, because you're projecting to the world a certain image. Aren't you kind of saying to the world, like, hey, you know, I am available, and et cetera? And she says, no. And he was shocked. He's a Baptist preacher. He was shocked. He says, what? How come? She says, I don't need a ring. What do you mean you don't need a ring? She says, I don't need a ring. So I'll, gi I'll give you the punchline later. Many years ago in the 90s, when I was in a van, it was a church outing with youth. And we were, we were on the road. And um, this girl, um, she, uh, her and her boyfriend were in the van. 
and there was a bunch of them there, and she asked me the question, Pastor, what do you think about wedding rings? She says, because I, I want a wedding ring when we get married. She says, because, and she was a pretty girl. She says, the guys, they're const- I'm, all, I'm constantly getting flirts. Guys are flirting with me all the time, and I feel I should, I should have a wedding ring once we get married to stop that. And so I told her, I said, I'll call her Becky. Her name's not Becky. I said, Becky, I said, um, a piece of metal on your finger absolutely does nothing to stop that. I said, I'll tell you what stops that. I said, your conduct. Men will know whether you're taken by your conduct, the way you behave yourself with them. And, and I said that because knowing her, she had this little bit of, you know, a little bit of that. And so I said, a ring is not going to stop you from being the person you are. And not wearing a ring is not going to stop you. you. If people, if guys flirt with you, what do you do? You watch your conduct and you say, no, I'm married. It's the way you behave. The guys are going to get very quickly whether you're available or not by the way of your conduct and your behavior. So the ring's not going to change you. You have to change. She, oh, she was just listening. <laughs> so my wife told the same thing to this guy just, just this past week. She says, no. What are my li-? And I told this Becky girl, I said, what are your lips for? When they flirt, I asked her this question. When they flirt with you, what do you do? Well, it's just constant. I said, do you say no? What do you think you, God gave you lips for? So, um, jewelry does not, or fancy clothing, or fancy cars, or watches, it doesn't enhance our existence. Uh, The point, I believe, is we are to be modest. Okay, number 15. How does Peter say Christians ought to dress? 1 Peter 3, verses 3 and 4. Who is adorning, let it not be that, what? Outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold. Look at the note. Both Peter and Paul indicate that Christian women, and by implication men as well, should dress simply without ornamentation. The beauty of Christians is to come from where? Within, not through ornamentation. Christians are to call attention to the Savior by their appearance. Christians will be known for who they are rather than what they wear. There's too much of emphasis on physical appearance nowadays. There's way too much. Um, We need to adorn the inside. Now, here's the flip side. Here's the flip side. Some Adventist Christians will go too far in the opposite and not care about their physical appearance. Okay? That's the flip side of the coin. I won't name the church. (laughs) But my wife and I were in another church in another state. And uh, I tell you, those ladies in that church, they could use a, a bit of mascara and makeup and lipstick. I mean, I'll tell you. Um, some can go too far on the other end and just be unkempt and not care of their physical appearance. That's not the meaning of these verses. That's not what God wants from us. So I think we should take pride in our appearance, but not go overboard into the realm of vanity and ornamentation, etc. So it, you know, and there's, I don't know if there's solid rules, but, you know, strike a balance. Care about our appearance. Oh, you know, you know, comb our hair, brush our teeth, you know, make sure things are straight. Make sure men in our church, make sure our clothes are ironed. Make sure you use some of this stuff, you know, uh, brush your teeth, uh, be polite, you know, don't speak in people's face like this if you didn't have a mint. <laughs> I'm saying we should be conscientious of our physical appearance without taking undue pride, undue pride in it. I wish I could speak better and more, be more articulate on that. By the way, so Helen, you asked about braiding of hair, braids. Um, I... I think, so let me give you an example, a couple examples. I think in those days, it was getting out of hand and the braiding of hair. I think what Paul is referring to is something ostentatious. Let me give you a flip example. Back in the 1800s, 
Ellen White counseled not to buy bicycles. Okay? And I wish I had that with me, the, the full... So I'm going on, you know, a faded memory here. She counseled people not to ride bikes. Well, if you rip it out of context and take that counsel as dogmatic, like braiding, if you take it as dogmatic, then shame on all of you for riding a bicycle. I know Carlos used to ride a bike to and fro. I don't know if you still do. He still does. Well, shame on you. <laughs> yeah, so the local, the context was it became a really popular thing. And apparently the merchants were spiking up the prices because everybody wanted a bike. And so they were expensive. They were very expensive. It's like, I got to have an iPhone. A thousand bucks. A thousand dollar iPhone. Got to have an iPhone. Now, don't you tell me that you're not influenced to one degree or another by the new gadgetry that comes out. Got to have an iPhone. It is a cool gadget to have. If you had the money, if you don't have the money, you probably won't even think about it. Just, oh, that'd be nice to have one. But if you had the bucks, everybody has an iPhone. It's the coolest thing. Now with the three little lenses on the, the new cameras and everything and, you know, et cetera. Got to have the latest. Well, it's going to cost you an arm and a leg and you end up, you know, $1,000. So I'm using that as an example. Do you really need a phone that costs that much? Carlos. To answer Ellen's question, the reason in that culture, when they would braid their hair, they would braid gold. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay, so yeah. It, it gave you a status. Status, yeah. To where That's a good point. If your braid was full of jewelry and gold, right. it was you were somebody. That's a good point. And so the braiding then became a symbol of status. So just for the recording purposes, what he was saying was that in those days, braiding could be embedded with gold in it. And it was a, a symbol of status and like, look at me. And so again, um, in, fact, <laughs> in fact, the very next verse, Paul says, women, shut up. <laughs> the very next verse says, women should not be speaking in the church. They should remain quiet. If they have any questions or anything you want to say, they should ask their husbands at home. Okay? Or in First, <laughs> or in first Corinthians chapter 11. Women, you are not to shave your hair, not cut it short, and you should not uncover your hair. And so are these things applicable because there were local cultural aspects to this? Or are they a dogmatic, non-negotiable rule for all times and for all places? So you honestly have to take an honest look at some of those questions. You, you really do. If you do it for attention, no. Let's, yes, don't do it for attention. Let's go on. Uh, uh, number 18. I skipped number 17. Number 18. What practice of Daniel should Christians today imitate? He blank three times a day. Pray. He prayed three times a day. Okay. And the reason for Daniel's extraordinary relationship with God was his regular prayer experience. If Christians today are to have a deep relationship with God, well, it, obviously we need to spend some time in prayer with God. And I think, I personally think that the Daniel praying three times a day, that is an obvious reference to more of the formal prayer time that he had. Uh, you know, opening the, his windows towards the, the west to Jerusalem. And, uh, you know, praying towards Jerusalem three times. I think it was, I think it's a reference because I can't see Daniel just praying three times a day. You know, did he pray four times a day? Five times a day? Six, seven, eight, nine, ten? I think he prayed continually the whole day. So I think this is a reference to more of his formal time of prayer. You know what I'm talking about. You have a formal time of prayer at your desk, at your bedside or wherever. And then you have your your other prayers that you pray throughout the day because you're occupied. You can't not unoccupy yourself. Um, so this was a, a very focused, intentional, one-on-one, -on -one formal type I believe is talking about. Um, what else can Christians do to build a relationship with God? 
This is, again, in the pastoral letters, Paul is really, really telling Timothy, hey, you got to do this. 2 Timothy chapter 3, this is what the Bible says, verse 15, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you what? What does it say? To make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And so the scriptures need to be a regular part of our daily living. They will make us wise unto salvation. There's such a thing as being wise unto worldly wisdom. And there's something as being wise unto salvation. And I'm not talking about we should not know how the world works and be worldly wise on how things work in this world and be smart and intelligent and, you know, how to operate intelligently in this world. Uh, you know, that's important. But there's a wisdom that begins with the fear of the Lord. Amen? It begins with humility that will lead, ultimately to, lead to salvation. And then, um, in, in fact, look at the next verse, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. This is what the Bible does for us. It reproves us. It scolds us. Gets after us. Tells us you're wrong in this or in that. That's what the scriptures do. It corrects us uh, like you have to constantly, when you drive, you don't just let go of the wheel. <laughs> you know, all well, the self-driving cars do, but you don't just let go of the wheel. You're constantly correcting yourself to stay in the lane, constantly. That's what scriptures do. I'll get to you in a minute, Julie. And it says for doctrine. You want correct doctrine? You got to go to the scriptures. Now, obviously, there's churches nowadays that teach different doctrines. <laughs> and so it behooves us to really rightly divide the word of truth and don't read it superficially. And then instruction in righteousness. The Bible instructs us, instructs us how to live in an integral and upright way, circumspect. Read, and not just reading our Sabbath school lessons. Yes. Because, you know, oh, I'm glad you were bringing this up. I'm glad you're bringing this up. Not just to study our Sabbath school lesson. Do not be a reflector of other people's thoughts. This is uh, sort of the potential hidden danger of the Sabbath school quarterly. I'm not saying not to read it. But it is a potential subtle danger that you will take those comments as the last word as opposed to reading the verses yourself concerning the context and reading all those verses and taking it in yourself. There's times where I've read the quarterly and I've read the scriptures and I've mulled over them and then I look at the question of the comments. I go, holy smokes, man, where did you come up with that? It's not even in the scripture. <laughs> Has you ever had that experience before? Where'd you come up with this? And sometimes I've, if I've taught, the, if I'll just cross it out and I'll write my own. Because this isn't in here. Or it's too subtle that it's not very instructive because it's a little bit too unclear. And so, uh, so I'm not saying get rid of your quarterly. That's not what I'm saying at all. They're valuable and keep on reading it. But read the scriptures for yourself. Let's go to the next question. Um, I'm gonna, I might have to just skip some here. Uh, prayer, scriptures... Chapter number 20, in addition to Bible study and prayer, another vital ingredient, personal relationship, is keeping the Sabbath day holy, living holy and keeping the Sabbath day holy. What is not done on the Sabbath? Work, number 21. Number 22, uh, we know when the Sabbath begins. Uh, and then number 23, people should regard the Sabbath a uh, delight, holy, honorable, um, and Number 24, what pleasure do we seek on the Sabbath? Nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Then shalt thou delight yourself in the Lord. That's Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58 is about fasting. If 
you read that book, that chapter, it's all about proper fasting. And God will say things like, isn't this the fast? You guys, uh, you know, go around, oh, I'm fasting, and your, your faces are all down. He says, isn't this the kind of fasting that I'm seeking to do what is right, to do justice, etc.? to give to the widow, to the poor, etc. That's the kind of fasting that I want. And then he talks about the Sabbath. And from doing your pleasure on, the own, on your own Sabbath, that's a reference to doing your own thing, whatever you want, on God's holy day. Whatever you want. And that's not what the Sabbath was defined, uh, um, uh, designed for, to do anything that we want. Who does the Sabbath belong to? God, why? Because Jesus says, the Lord is the Lord, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And so it's not to be a drudgery. Oh, I can't do this. I really wanted to go to Disneyland because the price has been cut in half. And Mickey Mouse's family is going to be there. And, you know, I get to ride on Goofy's shoulders on that day. You know, whatever. You know, we, we you don't do whatever you want on the Sabbath. There's a place where we consider that day different than the rest, etc. Now, um, go ahead. I, I like the list that it gives in the green, the note. It, it specifies what you can do. In the green and the note, I'm lost. Where? Oh, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, and it's really neat because it gives families an idea of what to do. Right. And, um, you know, I mean, go for a walk. Or... Yeah, in fact, uh, Julie and I had an interesting conversation about this a couple of weeks ago. Yes. We had a really interesting conversation um, because we were setting up, in fact, Joel was there too helping, we are setting up for the banquet on Friday and Saturday. So on Friday, um, we, were, we set up all the tables out there. Um, I, don't know, I don't remember what else we set up on Friday. Oh, we set up before the, the, bef chairs, the chairs, the tables, yeah. um, whatever we set up. And, but, and the lights, we get the lights. The lights before sundown on, on, on Friday. And then, uh, and then we stopped, and then we had to clean up. We weren't going to leave everything just messed up. We had to put, start putting away things for uh, church the next day. So we had this conversation about this. And then, uh, when was the banquet? Last Sabbath? No. Two weeks ago. Man, time flies. It's crazy how time flies. And that Sabbath morning you talked and lectured about the Sabbath. Yeah, so that morning I was talking about the Sabbath, and so we had a conversation about that. And then uh, after, do we have potluck? No, we didn't have potluck that day because we had the banquet. And so after that, then we finished setting up for the banquet. Um, I don't know, we put, did we put the, no, the Eiffel Tower was there already. The Eiffel Tower was there, but the, the lanterns weren't. We put up the lanterns. And the heaters, you know, we redid the heaters where they should go. And yeah, those outside heaters, we, yeah. we, re, we just repositioned them, yeah. et cetera. So this brings up an interesting point. This, this is what you're talking about. So we're talking about the Sabbath. This brings up an interesting point. Um, so what I re in our conversation, I remember saying, where in the Bible, in the Old Testament, or in the New, is there a list of to-dos and not-to-dos on the Sabbath? A list. There isn't. Okay, there's no list. But there are certain cases in the Old Testament where God's leaders are upset with God's people because they're breaking the Sabbath. And there's certain things that they were doing that illustrates this. Do you remember? Okay. Well, that's in the New Testament. She's speaking but in the Old Testament. I'm thinking of Nehemiah. Do you remember that story about Nehemiah? They were buying and selling. Yes. They were buying and selling on the Sabbath, and Nehemiah was very upset. And so he ordered that the gates be locked from evening, from sundown to sundown, the Sabbath hours, because they were buying and selling. And in fact, I think in that context, he says, if you keep on doing this, I'm going to pull your beards. 
<laughs> something, something, something like that. Ouch! I mean, you can just hear, you can just see a man of God. What do you think you're doing? Oh! <laughs> just, ow! <laughs> you know, I mean, that's just, that's just so funny. Um, or he was either talking about, you know, as a result of breaking the Sabbath or the intermarriages, because that was another problem that they had in his day, that they were intermarrying with uh, the non-Hebrews. There's another example where Moses was upset because people were gathering wood on the Sabbath. And there's another case, what? That's the other case in Exodus 16, where some people... Uh, we're going to go out in early Sabbath morning anyways and collect some manna. <coughs> Probably because of the lust of the eyes. You know, have some more. And it didn't work. There was no manna on the Sabbath. So there are a few uh, of those cases, and there may be one or two others I can't think of now, but where there's specific activities that are described that were prohibited so kindling, collecting wood, kindling fire, which is why Orthodox Jews, I have to stay in the camera, which is why Orthodox Jews, and, and I hope I'm not mistaken on this, will not turn on and off light switches. Orthodox Jews, on the Sabbath, because that's like kindling fire. And that's akin in our modern context of the light and the electricity and that's, that's, uh, that's the modern equivalent of kindling a fire, turning on and off a, a light switch. Now, you know, that may be the very orthodox, more of the strict sect of the Jews. Um, but other than that, there's no list to do or don't. And then we started talking about, well, what is considered work? So going back to the banquet preparation, what is considered work? Um, if we are preparing for something um, that is not secular in nature, in other words, we're, we're, it's a banquet for the church, is social in nature. It's not secular in the sense we're buying and selling. That's what I mean. So is it okay to prepare things like that? So for example, like fellowship. The banquet is a fellowship time. The, the potlucks are a time of fellowship. And there's preparation done for potlucks on the Sabbath. So we were having this conversation. And um, where do you draw the line of what not to do on the Sabbath? Where do you draw the line? I, and I'm not presenting you a line this morning, tonight, today. We have the church breakfasts. Which our potluck leader does our best to prepare things ahead of time. But there is some cooking done on the Sabbath for a breakfast. Like if you want to go and you can order an omelet. And it's, it's done right in front of you. So I honestly want to get your feedback. Where, where is the line drawn as far as how much is too much to do on the Sabbath? It's pleasure or work for income. I ran a homeless mission for two years. I had to work. Of course, my Sabbath was a Sunday at that time. But I right. had to work on Sunday at the home. People come in off the streets. I had to supply them with. Support. Okay, so if it's pleasure or work for income. Yeah, revenue. Yeah. Revenue. Okay, so here's uh, somebody in the medical field will ask you, well, um, I take care of the elderly on the Sabbath, and I'm paid for it because I'm a caregiver. But that's not secular work in nature. I have to take care of the elderly. I can't tell the elderly, well, you're gonna have to poop on Sunday because I am not gonna change you on Sabbath. <laughs> I mean, you know, somebody else had their hand up. Bianca, did you have? Not I've, yet. What was that? Not yet? Or was it? Go ahead, Carlos. I guess we have to refer to Paul. <clears throat> and he says, if in your mind is wrong, then it is. Yeah, so Paul says this, Paul says this in Romans. Yeah, I did. Paul says this in Romans 14. <laughs> the very last verse of Romans 14. He says, if you're doing something not of faith, then it is sin to you. And Romans 14 talks about the conscience. His, his focus is really on a lot of being sensitive to not our own conscience, but to other people's consciences. So as a matter of fact, you know, if we were to, we, we tried our best to set things up for the banquet, but I would say 
if there is anybody who is not comfortable putting the lights up for the evening, then don't do it. Don't do it. Sometimes that's hard to do because then people will say, well, but we don't want to feel like we're not wanting to help, etc. So, you know, we're not perfect. I'm not perfect um, by no means. But this is an interesting conversation and I wasn't even planning to go here. <laughs> How much is, is too much? When Helen and I were in Israel, we spent some time with the Jewish couple. We got talking about Sabbath and how they, the things that they do on Sabbath, the things that they don't do. And uh, they, you know, they would have people over and stuff, but they didn't do any dishes. They just put them in the. And so then right. they, on Sabbath evening after sundown, then she would do, because they have two sides of the kitchen. They got the side of the kosher and the side that's not kosher. Okay. So then she would do the kosher side or vice versa. And then open in the refrigerator. Wait, wait, wait. What do you mean she would do the kosher side? She yeah. would wash the dishes on the kosher side and he would wash the dishes because they can't be mixed. Right. So, but uh, after the after Sabbath the hours. Time, yeah, okay. So, you know, that's kind of interesting. Right. We kind of believe the same thing. We should do minimal. Right. And, you know, I know some, some people, when I've been over their house, they will rinse the dishes, leave them in the sink, that kind of thing. And then at, after sundown, they'll run them in the dishwasher. And that kind right. Of stuff. Okay. And then the other thing that was kind of amazing me is opening the refrigerator. Because when you open the refrigerator, the light comes on. Yeah. So they have, <laughs> yes, I've read that. They have a refrigerator where you can turn that off so that you can still open the refrigerator and the light comes on. Yeah. Or, you know, before, these, before the Sabbath, you just unscrew the bulb. <laughs> you know, then the light won't turn on. Yeah. I'd just like to say about, Christ said about the ox in a ditch. Mm -hmm. I can imagine what kind of work, how dirty, filthy it yeah. would be. I know. Especially if you couldn't get your neighbor to help you, trying to get that ox out of a ditch. Right. Teaming up another horse or another ox to pull it out. Right. And, you know, yeah. that's something you wouldn't want to do on the Sabbath, but you wouldn't want to keep it in the ditch. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And evidently he... he you know, he evidently Jesus knew that on the Sabbath there was a potential of an animal falling down in a ditch, a big animal like that. You're just going to leave it there? And so, yeah. Now, this is, and then he says, how much more valuable is a human being than an animal? So, and so in that case that you're saying, it's a matter of saving, saving an animal's life, or much more important, saving a human's life. On the Sabbath, rescuing. Anybody else have any thoughts? Well, we're supposed to, it's supposed to be a delight. It's supposed to be a delight, of course. It shouldn't be a drudgery. No, the Sabbath should not be a drudgery. It should be a delight. What I love about the Sabbath, personally, is that you know we put aside you know the stuff of the world. We can put aside. Yeah, you put aside the, the stuff of the world. Yeah. It's just so nice to put all that stuff aside. Right. And just rest. Not only. Right. Time. Yeah. And can spend time with God and get refreshed. Right. Singing or yeah. whatever. You know, I, I opened up the Shabbat last night with a friend of mine who's been ill and been moving. And she was just so moved by it. And, you know, I sang some mm -hmm. uh, songs from the, from the Psalms and stuff. Right. And she was just, we had the candle light. No. I should give you the mic. I should have given you the mic. But yeah, yeah so welcoming the Sabbath. You. Right. Like yeah. And you know, and it should be a day of, uh, like you said. The Sabbath should be a day of, of delight, of rejoicing. fulfillment, rejoicing, of service. You know, of service. Yes. People. Yeah. So I think I think what's very important is um, to remember that um, you will, we will always have differing opinions as far as what to do and what not to do on the Sabbath. You're going to have variations. You will. And so um, I think there's pr things where, that are probably just completely off limits to do, or, or excuse me, not to do on the Sabbath. Um, let's paint the church, <laughs> you know, on the Sabbath. You know, so now let's, let's go away from the Sabbath because we've emphasized the Sabbath for the last 15 minutes or so. Um, as far as holy living, so let's wrap this up. As far as holy living is concerned, um, these new lessons are going to write will include this, what I'm talking about. 
Holy living means what Jesus said, if you want to fulfill the law, if you want to fulfill the law, then he says, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Okay? On, uh, upon these two, he says, the first greatest commandment is love of God. The second is like it, he says. Love your neighbor as yourself. Upon these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Everything hinges on those two commandments broad principles which includes the golden rule of course loving your neighbors yourself the golden rule um, and I say this because the way we treat others the way we treat other people is a fulfillment of the law as much as keeping the Sabbath is and so it, we humans are so funny. <laughs> We're so funny. We'll focus on this and sometimes overly focus at the expense of ignoring something else, depending on who you are. We're just funny that way. So we need to be patient with each other and tolerant of each other because I can focus on something and oh yeah, my humanity is, yeah, maybe I need to focus more on this. I'm, I'm neglecting this area of my life. That's the way we all are. We're, we're just like that. We're funny human beings. It's amazing how God has tolerated us and has so much patience with us. A but Jesus, A lot of Jesus' ministry here was offsetting a lot of these rules and regulations. Yes. So. Je Jesus, Jesus, in his ministry, um, often completely ignored, well, not often, he ignored these man-made rules that were made at the expense of ministering to others. This is where the Sabbath, uh, keeping the Sabbath really came into play. Not doing this or that at the expense of being a blessing to others. And so he completely just put to the side their Sabbath taboos and ministered to others. And they hated him for that. They hated him for that. They thought he was breaking the law. Um, because by the time of Jesus' day, oral tradition, the oral law was just as binding as the written law. It's just amazing. But um, <clears throat> living a holy life is not only about our appearance and keeping the Ten Commandments and the Sabbath, walking circumspectly. It's also how we treat others. It's also how we treat other people. Because people who focus on these other things that I said, these former things, man, they could be so nasty. You think they have a pitchfork and a fork tail in their, in their rumps. We have to be careful how we treat people um, because that is a fulfillment of the law. Love is the fulfillment of the law. You want to be a good Sabbath keeper? You want to be a good keeper of God's law? You want to be known as a Christian? Love. Obedience is a fruit of love. Nellen White says the most powerful argument, Jesus said this first, John 13, 35. All my disciples, everybody, the whole world will know that you're my disciples if what? You love each other. If you love each other. And Ellen White says the most powerful argument, the most, the most convincing argument in favor of Christianity is a loving and lovable Christian. A loving and lovable Christian. This is, uh, I think more importance needs to be placed on this without neglecting the other things that we talked about. So, that's a good note, I think, to leave off on and finish this Daniel seminar. Did you enjoy the seminar? Amen. So, if you want those lessons that are lacking, I can just bring out the whole box and you can choose which ones you want to take home. I still have some. I think there's one lesson, number 17 or 19, or I can remember that uh, that is missing. So why don't we all stand and any more questions or comments? No? Okay. <laughs> let's stand and let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we are so thankful for this last month of these presentations in the book of Daniel. We are 
We are touched by the stories and we are informed by these prophecies. Help us, Lord, to live our lives in a way that brings honor and glory to you. And we anxiously await for our final ultimate deliverance from this world. Help us to live according to the way you live, Jesus. Walk the way you walked. To purify ourselves, knowing what will happen ultimately to this world as it is. So help us to purify ourselves and to be transformed by your word and prophecies, not only informed. Thank you for your blessing this whole month and help us to continue in your word, to live by it, pattern our lives by it. In Jesus' name we pray and everyone said, Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. That's the end of the Daniel Seminar. There's, there's uh, those materials out in the lobby. You probably have all the materials that are out there. It's been out there for a month, but um, you can take them and share them with friends, not just for yourself. So, you know, take some of that stuff and share it. So you can be seated and um, I'm going to bring those other lessons out. So if you could uh, just be patient with me and I'll put them out here. I'm going to put them out here on the piano is what I'll do. Thank <laughs> you.